if you told me that I'd be doing stuff for Bugatti in, in like high school, I, I think you're crazy, man. I think that's just it. Just get out and do what you love. Thanks for joining us, William. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so basically, if you want to just start off and just tell us, you know, who you are, where you're from, and maybe a little bit how you got into filmmaking. Yeah, so um, I'm based here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I've been filming for uh, quite, quite, a, quite a long time. It kind of started very early on when I was a kid, and a lot of my friends and I, loved watching action movies we loved we loved to sleep over and just watch movies and uh, eventually we wanted to just making our make our own movies and so it, it started out as us just we and it's kind of funny the way we would uh, film it but we, we didn't really have cameras to use like video cameras so but one of our friends had a macbook it was like i don't know if you remember the polycarbonate uh, days of macbooks when they were like made of plastic or they were white or black and so we would hold it like this and we would run around and we would film using the eyesight camera. And we had a whole bunch of Nerf guns. We'd make all kinds of like war movies and stuff like that, zombie movies. And um, we would dabble in After Effects when we watch tutor tutorials. Um, I'm trying to remember, there's a guy I used to watch a, a lot of tutorials of. I think his name was something Kramer. And uh, he was a, a, a really talented VFX artist um, around 2012 and 2011. Um, and we would also uh, take a lot of inspiration from this other guy on YouTube named Freddie Wong. Um, they were doing a lot of stuff out in California at the time. And uh, we were just obsessed with it. I mean, every, uh, during school, we would talk about it at lunch. And then once we get back, we would start working on more videos. And uh, yeah, it was just a very obsessive thing. And then once high school came around, I, uh, I got introduced to the car world. I didn't really know much about cars. And uh, my friend took me to like a a cars and coffee and i thought it was really really fun and um at one point i was like you know it'd be cool to you know make car videos you know maybe I can put some together and you know i i found some some stuff online um there was a you know like car feature content i was like this is really sick like i should take two of these roles and just clash them together so i did that and that was a that that took off a lot for me and um I would end up just asking people to, you know, shift to locations and shoot uh, videos of the cars. Uh, no plans, no nothing. And uh, that progressed and uh, eventually got hit up to do some other projects outside of there. And um, that kind of built the entre entrepreneurial spirit on the side of, you know, making a videography business, video production business, whatever you want to call it. And um, by the time, you know, I was ready to graduate, um, I told my family, you know, I'm just going to, I just want to stick with this. And so I kind of just kept focusing on that and it kind of just kept scaling. I didn't really expect it to keep going. Um, and yeah, it's, it's taken me quite, quite a long way, I feel like, but, uh, there's still a lot more to go. And, um, uh, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of like the small little backstory behind where I've kind of got to from now. It's just been, just been a very obsessive thing I've, I've always done in my free time. Growing up around cars, like your first experience was kind of like going to the cars and coffee or was your like your dad or your friends into cars as well? Yeah, I actually, I just showed up. Uh, I had a friend of mine that told me about it. He couldn't go at the time. And so it was just me there. And I was like, this is so cool. And it, it just became really obsessive. And like the next time I'd mark all my calendar of what the next upcoming events were, I'd be, I'd get there at like 5 a.m. in the morning, like just to like talk to people and get the ball rolling that morning. I was just really excited. It was one thing I really, really looked forward to waking up in the morning. Um, and uh, we have a we have a, a cars and coffee event called Caffeine and Octane. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's the biggest cars and coffee gathering in the nation here in the U.S. Um, and so it's it's ma I mean it's massive. It's really huge. It's very overwhelming. Um, it's almost like you can't even finish the event by the time the day is over. It's really big. Um, but yeah, that kind of is what started and I, I made a lot of friends there and that kind of, that kind of just kind of grew a tree of different opportunities and friendships and relationships with people. And, uh, that's kind of where it all kind of kicked off in the, in the car world, I think. Cool. And was there like a particular type of car that you were, 
I guess, like attracted to? Like, did you like the classic cars or like the JDM or like the supercars? Like, what kind of car did you first see and think, oh, that's cool? Yeah, I think the uh, the first thing that caught my eye um, was was uh, JDM cars. I thought they were really really cool. I loved all the wide body kits, the air ride, the every all that stuff. I thought it was really really sick. Um, and then eventually, I, I kind of grew branches in the other spaces, and I saw classics, and then I got to know about Porsches and all these other things. And um, it, it, I, the only reason I would fall into these other cars is that I would meet people that would tell me about them. And once I understand the history about something, then I can really appreciate what it is. I can look at it and be like, oh, like that's cool. I know, I know exactly why, how it got to that point. And uh, that's kind of how things kind of just migrated from there. Cool. And then you, you mentioned that you inspired from YouTube, like videos about filmmaking. Was it the same with cars? Like when you wanted to learn more about a certain car, would you go to YouTube or like, how would you learn more? Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd say I spend a lot of time on YouTube. Um, there's a lot of different creators. Obviously everyone's watched Doug. Um, you know, there's, I, I think for the filming aspect of part, I think, um, around an early high school, I think I watched a lot of Mike Koziel and um, I wa really, really analyzed a lot of his films. Like even just the sound, the music choice and the framing and the cutting, I would just like, I would spend hours rewatching and rewatching and rewatching and rewatching. Then I would take that and then I would go find a car and I would try to re recreate my own but based on what I've learned from just analyze, like over analyzing these videos on YouTube. Um, and that's kind of the way I, I got better at it. Um, and I just kept doing that process over and over again. And, um, you know, what's cool is, is now I've, I've been lucky enough to kind of work with him on projects. It's kind of come full circle. So, you know, five years from there to here, it's like really, really cool to see. But that's, I guess that was one of your big inspirations was Mike Koziel. And then you're able to work with him. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, he took it. He had a very, like, uh, a very interesting style that I thought was very, very, like, striking to me. And it just stuck out like a sore thumb compared to all the other content out there. And uh, I mean, I just, I just, I just obsessed with it. And it, that's how it just got into me and it kind of grew me from there. Cool. And was there any like kind of feature films that you remember seeing at an early age that you were like, wow, like I want to do filmmaking or was it more like YouTube? Movies always inspired, you know, me and my friends to make, you know, action movies together on our own or on little short films. I mean, we, we'd take Nerf guns and, and we'd put muzzle flashes on the end of them through After Effects. And then we'd figure out how to motion track blood splatter on the walls. And if we shot the gun, that it would add brightness to the walls based on the keyframes. Like, just like stuff like that was like really fun and, and so cool to learn. Um, just figuring out how all that stuff works. But we, uh, I mean, we watched all kinds of movies. We were we were obsessed with just about everything we saw. Um, we just wanted to make it ourselves. I think that was the, the biggest part was like, we should do this ourselves. And that process and being very collaborative and everyone taking ideas and, you know, we're all kind of trying to shape the story into what we want to be, um, I think was like a super fun process. And what kind of like, so it was like action movies, like what kind of action movies would you like see and want to emulate? I think it's just a, the culmination of all these movies we've been watching and just wanting to have, wanting to make ones ourselves, um, and enjoying the process of that was like, I think the really, the really, uh, the really cool part about it that we really liked. Um, and you know, we, I think the biggest inspiration that we had that wanted us to keep making more was we watched these other YouTubers like Freddie Wong. Um, I can send his stuff. I, I hope it's still up there. It's been an eon. It's like rocket, rocket jump. Is that his? Yeah. Yeah. So Corridor Digital, Freddie Wong, that whole crew out in California. Uh, I mean, we would just watch their videos in, in school, in class. And I mean, it was, it was, we would send it to each other and get, make plans to hang out the weekend and just sleep over three nights in a row until we've knocked the video out. Like we just had a good time. It was, it was really fun. Yeah. When was, the, when was the first time you like picked up a camera, like, shot something and then put it into your computer or wherever and just looked at it and thought, oh, and then started. I was probably like 11 or 12, I think. Um, my family got me a GoPro. It was the first one. It had the, the uh, it had a, um, a viewfinder. 
This is like the first generation GoPro that came out. It had a view, it had a plastic viewfinder in it. Um, and I thought 60 FPS at like 4, 480 by whatever was like the coolest thing. I was like, oh, that's ultra high speed slow motion. Um, but it was absolute garbage quality, but it was really cool to play with. And I think I didn't really know what I was doing, but I, I just wanted to just experiment and figure out how, how it worked so that once I figured that out, I could actually start using it to like really make some stuff with it. But I think once that kind of graduated into being able to use a, a laptop with the camera on there and having friends and, and us watching all these YouTube videos and these content creators, I think that's where it really kicked off when we started making like real proper videos with like actual storylines to them. Uh, they were like really gripping and like really fun to watch. And how old were you then when you started working with your friends? About 13 or 14, 13 or 14. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then what program were you guys editing on? Like you said, After Effects, but we're you using Premiere Pro as well. We had After Effects, we had Premiere, and then we had iMovie. Um, we couldn't do any of the effects we wanted to in iMovie, so we had to have After Effects. I think we like ripped it or something because we couldn't have, we couldn't afford it back then. That was when you could rip it, that stuff. You can't rip it now, I don't think. But um, we had, I think it was a lot of iMovie for like the basic cuts, and then After Effects for all like the special effects and and all that other jazz. Yeah. Yeah, because Adobe got smart and turned it into a monthly subscription thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you edit on nowadays? Do you use Adobe or do you use uh, DaVinci? Or... Um, yeah, I use. I would say I definitely use a lot of Premiere. I use a lot of the Adobe Suite. Um, but I'm looking to kind of navigate around that and probably get out of it at some point and maybe move to DaVinci just because... Adobe has its own nuances that I haven't seen to be solved over years. I've gotten used to solving a lot of its own pro a lot of its problems it likes to throw at me. So I'm pretty good at that and troubleshooting whatever whatever software bugs it has. Uh, but there's just certain things that just don't make sense to me that just seems really backwards. And I know DaVinci's great and I've dabbled a little bit into it. Um, I, just, I think I gotta spend more time with it. And I think the color, the color grading opportunity in, in DaVinci is explosive compared to uh, Premiere, I think you can do a lot more in a short amount of time. It's a lot more efficient in uh, DaVinci versus all the other programs. It's yeah. a matter of taking time with it. And plus, I mean, like the thing is with work, if I get, get a project, I don't, it's not a time to experiment. So these personal, these passion projects I do on the side, that's when I experiment with that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it's better to use something that you're familiar with in case you run into a problem. You don't have time to like solve it. Yeah. When I mean, if you got a deadline, yeah. Um, so do you remember like the first job that you had? Like, did you have a job that wasn't filmmaking or? I'm pretty sure the first job like paid was maybe a music, I think it was a music video. Um, like Atlanta, we have like a really big rap rap scene here. Uh, a lot of rappers come out of Atlanta. And I think that was like where that started. That was like my first paid gig. Um, and we just, that didn't have any plans. They just said, Hey, we got some money for you. Like, could you make us a video? And I'm like, sure. And it was like, I think it was like a hundred bucks or something. Like it wasn't anything serious. Um, but I was excited and we ran through it and made it happen. And then I think it kind of just got bigger and bigger and bigger from there. And eventually I did like event coverage, uh, for like some car, some car events that had kind of small, those had small budgets too, but you have to understand, like at that time, like I didn't really have like any established like presence. I kind of was just trying to learn and still figure out and meet. I was still meeting a lot of people then, and uh, I think that was uh, I think that was like kind of the first the first like paid products I started to receive, which was really it was really incredible because like I was bouncing like working at Chick Fil A at the time, and to like be able to make some money on the side from like something I love was like really really awesome. Cool. So like Chick-fil-A, was that your first like job that wasn't filmmaking? First job job. Yeah. Very boring. Incredibly. You get overworked and underpaid. And uh, I looked at, I, when I first looked at my page, I'm like, this is not, this is not life. This is not life. So yeah, like I guess working in a, like a fast food restaurant, you are able to see that, you know, 
maybe that's not the life that you wanted, like you wanted to pursue filmmaking even more. Yeah, it's just because my family said, you need to have a job in the summer. I'm like, okay. So I got, that's where I ended up working. And then when you go to these car shows, like what's your, I guess, uh, technique or theory behind like meeting people? Do you just go up to them and like, do you have a camera with you and kind of give your card out or like, how do you start the conversation? Yeah, I was talking to people and getting conversations going. And then I made friends with people and then they saw my videos and then we, we would talk about making a video together and other people would see it. They would tag me and then other people would follow me. And then if they had a cool car, I'd hit them up. And it was just, it's just, just constantly just asking people, Hey, like, would you be down to make a video? And, um, they'd be happy with it. And we just, this, those relationships would just continue to develop and people, other people would see it, they would post it. And then just kind of, it's just kind of get growing. Is that through like Instagram or like YouTube or Instagram in person, not so much through YouTube. Um, but definitely a lot more in-person conversations for sure. It was just a lot of breaking the ice and just asking them and saying, Hey, I have this idea. Would you be down? Like, would you have like an hour left after the event? We go, there's one, I know there's one place that's like really close by and it'd be, yeah, they'd just say yes. I mean, go do it. So how did, so that, that was kind of your showreel by doing those videos. Did you ever cut like a montage, like as a showreel together from all that stuff or you just kind of took it project by project? I think it just did project by project and never put in together a, a big showreel. I think it was just, uh, yeah, it was just project by project. It was, is that your own company that you started or is that like working with other people? It's called, I just had like a brand name and I used to call it just like sit and visuals is my last name with the word visuals and back picks. I, I look at what everyone else called their stuff and they would be like visuals or media or digital. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just make my own. And like, it felt cool. Like, I, I, I think it was really, it was really cool at the time. Like I thought like, you know, everyone wants to build a company or have a brand and a business. And I was really upset. I thought that was really cool. And I, I even like made stickers. I, I, I gave out stickers and you put on the car. I don't do that anymore. I should probably do that again. So that was, I mean, that was fun, but, um, yeah, that was just, uh, was just getting the brand name started and I would have an account I'd post everything underneath that account. And uh, that's when everyone would recognize my work from was under that name. It's just like building a brand, you know, getting people to know who you are. Yeah, 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 exactly. So how did you like transition from just doing like people's cars to doing more like corporate type, more branded things for like uh, big companies, bigger companies? Um, it was a slow process and very gradual. And I think um you know it started with me just like assisting on these sets and like looking at other people and you know a lot of sets can be really big and small like you know a lot of this not some branded content doesn't require like a thousand people like it could be like for like a skeleton crew of four and um i paid on like on like a mercedes-benz uh dealership commercial that was local to me and uh that was really cool and i could kind of see how that worked and um it just kind of like came it stuff just kind of came naturally over time um it's but it started very small and um the more videos i made with people the more i get recommended to help other people and then i they had some of those people had their own companies and then i would do videos for their businesses and then they would just refer me around um and i would reach out to people online and i asked to make videos sometimes they wouldn't respond so i just kept moving on to the next person and uh, it was just kind of like a hustle to kind of get in contact with people because I really wanted to make bigger stuff. Like I was really, I wanted to do, I wanted to work with big brands. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it was, a, it was just kind of like a very slow and steady, steady race to get to that point. So it's a bit of like you mentioned outreach, like how many, like did you message DM through Instagram or you send emails? called well, it's like and it's even just like making friends with people like even if you're a friend of someone who's not maybe they're not bmw right maybe they don't work at bmw but they're a friend of yours like maybe they have a family member that just became the marketing coordinator at you know bmw north america like that that could land you a job there like that could be your your door into a project so like a lot of a lot of my projects become some of them most of them come indirectly um and I mean, that's how, that's how some of my work has come. And, 
Um, and then it's just been referral based. So, you know, as long as you do a good job and you deliver on time and you're consistent and you're easy to work with and you're good with talking to people, I think it's just, it's, you know, that's people just want to, you know, please their bosses at these companies. So if you can make their life easier and, you know, provide them what they need on a certain time, fr time frame, they just continue to refer you to other people. So it ends up working out really well. And that's how I kind of built my track record with, um, with uh with my uh my professional working experience so how did you like get to like rimac and bugatti was that like through another friend or yeah so it was just through a friend of mine that was a photographer and they they were like a car they started out as like a car spotter um so same boat but just photos and they would shoot cars and they met a lot of people and they talked to a lot of people and he would travel around and he made a lot of friends and he had a friend of his that was looking for a photographer at the time or he had a, a friend of his that was uh, going to do, to do the job with remots and um he couldn't do it so he reached out to my buddy and so my buddy was said yeah i'll do it and then they asked him to say hey do you know when he does videos and they said well i know i have a friend of mine who's in atlanta and then they reach out to me and I showed them my work, and I guess at the time it, the stars kind of aligned. They liked what I made. They liked what I've, I've generated from my portfolio. That coupled with my buddy putting me in a referral with them, just like allowed me to kind of work with them. And um, that was my first kind of ticket into working with a, a really big company. You know, like no agency involvement, so I have complete control over the final the final image, which is awesome. And um, that kind of uh, that kind of grew from there. And another year went by and they hit me up again and they wanted me to do some more stuff. And then there, they just did a merger with Bugatti. Right. So I never, I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone at Bugatti, but they did a, like remods just bought out Bugatti. So they now are good. They know everyone there. And so their marketing coordinator for Bugatti needed a, a videographer for car week. And so they referred me over to her. For that week so i ended up doing videos for i ended up generating same day coverage for a whole week for both remots and bugatti it was a shit ton of work but i made it happen and uh it was it was really cool to just add that to the list but like it's it's like that it's like it's indirect like like i don't expect a job to come from a merger but it, that's like that's one thing that can happen and uh or you have a friend of yours that just recently got a job and now they're working for porsche now they say hey like i have a buddy of mine well i want to put you on all my projects and Stuff like that can happen. So, um, cause I don't think if I reach out to Bugatti directly, it, it would probably be a, I don't think it'd go anywhere. They probably get hit up by people all the time, you know? Like you said, it's, it's all about networking. And a lot of the times that's who, you know, and, and, and there's uh, going to be good at talking, you know, if you can shoot cool videos, that's great, but you gotta be able to do the talking part because at the end of the day, it's up to you to make connections and meet with people and, you know, just have fun with it. And, you know, the guy you meet at a cars and coffee event might be the, the might be the person who gets you a job at Bugatti. You know, you never know. <laughs> so, did you have like an initial meeting with them, like why, like was it like a Zoom meeting type thing like this, or did did you just get to work straight away for the first video? We we set up a, we set up a few meetings, um, and we would talk and discuss, and they had to. They had a brief outline that their marketing team put together that of what they wanted from me or what they needed to continue, you know, their you know content calendar uh, for other social media uh, platforms. And um, once I understood that, it was just you know give them a budget, tell them what it's going to cost, and then we just go from there. And then start booking flights and hotels and cars, and we just go out and knock it out and I keep them updated throughout the process. And um, it's a lot of work, but um, I, I'm, I mean, it's, it's, it's really rewarding. It's really rewarding for sure. It's worth, it's worth all the, it's worth all the work. Cool. And did you get to meet the, the CEO, like, um, Matt, Matt Tay? I've met Matt Tay a few times. Um, we actually just wrapped a, wrapped a project earlier last month in uh, Ohio. We did a, we just delivered, um, I think it was the, the two first North American deliveries. Um, and so Mate flew out. And uh, we delivered the cars. We gave them a video to have their deliveries. Um, it was a, you know, there's a family out there, and it, uh, we just had a good time. Um, so it's just been a constant, you know, relationship that's grown to come with them. And um, 
you know, even though, even though like, uh, you know, sometimes you can work, work, work with these companies and you have relationships with them, but you know, there's a lot of guys with different styles out there. So they, you know, if they have one project, they may want to use someone else completely different because there's tons of people that got different styles out there. Um, but, um, you know, I've, I've been kind of working with them on the side whenever they need me and, uh, we just kind of get it going, but, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cause I saw like the triple F, um, video on this YouTube and I saw you in the background running around with the camera. Yeah. 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 yeah that, you, was, uh, that was pretty awesome. So you were shooting that like vertically, you had the camera like flip, but so you, they were wanting specifically for like Instagram reels. Yep. We wanted vertical videos. So, um, I had my camera mounted vertically. Uh, we were using a FX3, really great camera, uh, especially for vertical video work. It's got the it's got the quarter inch threads on the side of it, which is awesome. You don't have to get a bracket; you just mount it and go. Um, and the great thing about Sony is that um, in that camera, it automatically orientates all the videos. So when you throw it into post and edit. Your videos are already they don't have to you don't have to add 90 degree rotations to every single frame with every single video so brilliant camera to work with for vertical video coverage i think it's awesome highly recommend that camera are you a sony ambassador not a sony ambassador but i've i've used about all the brands i've had canon yeah. sony uh panasonic um black magic i've used all i just i rent i rent, I, I use what i need depending on the project um, if it's just boring talking heads, like I'll rent two black mat, two pockets. Um, if it's, I'm going to be running around all day out in the sun and it's really hot out. I'm not going to carry the heaviest camera I can find. I'm going to carry like an FX three and a good lens and keep this setup really lightweight and just go. Right. Cause I did the, the thing for me is I don't want, I I'm, I'm really against big rigs. I think big rigs are awful and inefficient to work with. There's too many variables. There's too much tooling. That's required to 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 make a, an image come to life. I think it's ridiculous. Um, there's, I mean, there's certain times when it, it makes sense, right? If you got a big crew of people and you got all the time in the world to shoot on a set in a controlled environment, I mean, but when you're doing like um, content coverage work, like there's no time to uh, to mount rods in a and sync a focus motor and ha have 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 first AC with you. Like it just doesn't make sense. So I like to focus on the content. And not on the equipment when I'm shooting. Yeah, and like having a big camera, especially when you're doing like run and gun stuff out in the real world where it's not a closed set, like you get a lot of tension. Like people look at you, and like the cops will, or like the if you're shooting in a store, they'll be like, "You can't film here." Whereas you have a little camera, you can kind of get away with a lot more. Yeah, and it makes it makes the environment a much easier, especially you know, like especially when we did the triple F uh, delivery. Like you don't have a big camera in their face and you're not like an inconvenience to the space around you. And like, you can't fit in a car. I get a remove an easy rig. Like there's a guy, I think it was at Amelia Island doing uh, content coverage. And he had an easy rig and a, and a Ronin two and a full size red. He was sweating his ass off. And I'm like, that looks miserable. And he had two guys following him around. And I'm like, I don't like, that's not, that's, that's a very inefficient way to get content. I mean, it's, it's just event coverage. It's not a movie, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. and the people consuming the content at the end, they are not going to be like, Oh, he used an Ari ultra prime. Wow. You know, like they're just going to, they're going to want to share the post if they see a cool car in there. So you got to understand, I, I think it's just understanding what's, what, what's the right tool to use for the right environment. Um, cause all that gear is great, but it just, it needs to be, I think it needs to be used uh, effectively and efficiently. Yeah, so that's that's a good point. Like, especially with like social media and events, like they want it like straight away, and it's kind of like a competition to who you know, especially like a car reveal. It's like who can upload it fastest and have the best video. So, to be messing around with reds and trying to edit all that big codex, like all the footage and stuff, it's going to be a, a lot a lot of work. So you mentioned you went to Car Week and you filmed like the Bugatti um booth like and you edit was that like you mentioned like a same day edit do you want to just like talk through like the process of how you how you made that particular video so it all started with a lot of planning um and a lot of like calendar and organization and and how i was going to split my time between two different brands in one day and 
you know, some of them had events in different areas of, of in Monterey. So it was a lot of planning and like logistics of how I'm going to get to where I am and splitting my time effect effectively in each location. And um, from there, you know, it's just going out and shooting. And then I would, I would put, I would kind of, I already like found out, I already like select the music I was going to use. I knew what I was going to make. Like I already knew that. I just, I just needed to get the content. Um, and so once I had out all that, I would go back to my hotel immediately and just start shopping through things. Um, and it was very easy to put together, but um, the hard part is just making sure that you have enough time to get the right moments for what they want um, included. And it's not an easy balancing two different brands that on in one day that both want same day content coverage. And the crazy thing is, is like, I don't get approval from Bugatti till like 2 a.m. in the morning because their marketing team's out of France. So even though I got uh, the marketing team that's on location in the U.S. with me in the hotel, like I can get their approval and be done and get thumbs up, but I, I can't go to sleep until I get uh, confirmation from their marketing team at 2 a.m. in the morning when they wake up. Uh, so it's uh, it, and then you got to beat up, be back up at like 8 a.m. or 6 a.m. to or 7 to get to the next location. We'll forget. We'll be want to drive like 40 minutes down the road to get to this like very special spot. Like it's. It's crazy, but it's uh, it's 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 controlled chaos. It's definitely controlled chaos. Yeah, that's that sounds pretty crazy. Um, so basically, you'd have everything planned out. Did you have like a a shot list, or maybe like a story? I guess you couldn't really storyboard, but did they have like you said moments that they wanted to capture? Like, did they give you a list? Like, we want to capture like smiles and handshakes and happy faces and dogs or like what kind of things did they kind of require? Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of discussion about what they want and include because that way you set expectations up front about what they can expect and, and when they get see it sent a video. Um, so we talk about all these things in, in phone calls and uh, we make sure that everyone's understands what's going to be captured and what's going to be included. Um, so it's like, do we want to focus on the environment? Do we want to capture drone shots of location? Um, you know, people talking, or we don't want anyone to talk. We just want shots of the car. Like that's all discussed up front. And um, once I have that, then I, I take notes. And I write all the stuff down. And I add that into my calendar of what I'm going to do that day. Um, it's just a lot of planning and organization for sure. And, and, and the thing is, like sometimes. Uh, event logistics don't always go to plan, so maybe that gets thrown out, and you just kind of work, got to work on the spot to develop a, a develop your own thing. But um, we try our best to plan um, these projects. Can, like especially like Car Week is a very, very like operationally expensive uh, um, project. So um, you know, like you got to have a lot of like upfront liquidity to put forward to cover costs of things um so like i'm talking like hotels flights if you had another guy with you, you got to cover his flight and his hotel stay in, in his rental car um so like i think like just that project alone was like around 10 grand in expenses and i didn't get that didn't get paid till like much later so you gotta be willing to to put for a lot of uh, a lot of upfront equity on these projects um so that's one thing i think does, doesn't get talked about a lot is that uh these projects can get very expensive you know? yeah yeah and so did you factor that in like before you went did you know that that was going to cost a lot yeah i mean i know we are this is all discussed we you know we put it, put together estimates and we talked back and forth about it and adjusted things and um you know that was going to be the expense plus you know what i charge and um yeah but um i think that's the biggest thing about these about running a business is that having the liquidity to be able to fork up you know at, at a moment's notice for a project you know Twelve to ten thousand dollars for one week, and that can go up exponentially the more guys you add on, you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was up at uh, Monterey for the first time last year, and I I just covered it for myself, like just for my Instagram, and I was just like filming a whole bunch of stuff, and yeah, it's definitely gets expensive with all like there's no real hotels available and the shittiest hotels they start charging like 800 dollars a night and it's like what the hell there's no there's no more space out there so it's like you're just staying somewhere out in salinas or somewhere that's far away and then you just drive in an hour every morning to get to the events yeah so it's it's pretty uh that's but that's like one of the biggest i guess events are you going again this year 
I think so. So um, I don't know who I'm going to work with, but I'm juggling several manufacturers, um, some contingent on whether or not other products go through. So it's a it's a fine balancing act at the moment. Um, so I have nothing solidified. Um, just a lot of talk in the air. And the thing is, these like even if um, they want to do stuff, like they don't. They, I don't get dates. I don't get dates and things sorted till like two weeks out before the event because they, they have to deal with logistics and event logistics is, is a nightmare. Um, so we don't really get things. I don't get, I don't really find out till like two or three weeks before the event. Yeah. I just got like an update on my watch from Pebble beach saying the media credentials approved. So I just like apply for a media credential to try and get in and just like build from there. Like you said, kind of like the, the, um, the car show, it's like the biggest car show there is, so you might as well try and cover it. But it's obviously better to have a brand on board before you go, but sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to go and just not work sometimes, but because I've never, I've never had that experience, just doing whatever I want. But um, you know, I, I, I have a business that day and in, in in livelihood, and I think if I combine both worlds, I think that's great. So. Yeah, for sure. And then the, so it's, it's pronounced re, remat, is it? Remots, remots. Remot, remot. Cause I always say remac, but it's the wrong. Mots. So the remots, uh, video that you filmed like along the bridge and like around that area, like how did you do that? Through drone up. We had, I think that we literally only spent 10 minutes filming that time because the car got a flat tire. So that video would have been way more epic had we had more time, but you just can't plan these things. That shit just happens. So we got a, we got a flat tire um, and we were able to get like 10 minutes. We were, I was able to get drone shots. So I had a photographer with me and he we ha I had him go up first while I got drone shots of the car and um, came back down. I hopped in and he drove me and it just quickly quickly ended, but we had enough footage to generate uh, what they wanted to, um, and they understand, they get it. Stuff happens, and they, we can't we can't just go back and film because we got the car has got to be somewhere else the next day. Um, and uh, it's actually really incredible. They they will if they need a part, they will like air freight it over the same day to the U.S. just to make sure that things stay on track. It's incredible how fast they work. It's like a, a race team almost trying to get the parts. I mean, it's and that they're I mean they're spending hundreds of thousands to, to be out there. So that uh, a $20,000 shipment is is like nothing to them. So yeah, the, the CEO, um, am I saying his name right? Mate? Mate. Mate. So Mate has an amazing story. Like is, is there any uh, um, plans for to make like a documentary about his life? You know, I've, I've thought about my head to do like some personal products with him. I think I'm just waiting to figure that, like solidify that myself and what I want, what I want to do. And then I was going to propose it to their team and say, hey, you know, I have this idea um, of, you know, videos you don't have. So it's got to be valuable to their business. You know, you know, go to, you know, go out to uh, Croatia and go work with him on a project would be would be pretty cool it's just i, I just want to kind of solidify that a little bit more but i've definitely had some ideas kind of mics i think the history is what makes something really cool definitely the history yeah because it's like the pinnacle of like starting like he was doing a bmw like he made himself with the electric motor i think there's like early footage of him and then he's built his business all the way up to buying bugatti it's kind of like crazy yeah, no, it's it's a uh, it's an incredible story, but um, I, he's really awesome to work with. So, how does your like pitching process work? Like, do you let the company come to you a lot of the times, and you just facilitate what they want, or are you always kind of like giving them ideas of what to use the video for? Like, obviously, some people talk about like return on investment and all that kind of stuff. Or are you trying to focus more on like engagement and views like or trying to tell a story like what is your kind of goal when you're going into like a a pitching process or like a meeting about creating a video you know it depends on the size of the company first generally speaking most big corporations have know exactly what they want because they have tons of people that work on this all the time 
and they have huge teams that do analytics and they know exactly what they, they want and need to keep growing. Um, but it's, it's the smaller companies that those, it's a matter of like listening and taking in about what they're telling you and then reading the room to see what they maybe don't understand or they don't know and, and kind of help kind of navigate them and hold their hand in a way that helps them get the most value out of what they're about to spend money on. Um, and I think for the smaller companies, there's a lot more of that the hand holding than there is in the on the big projects. Big projects, yeah, because it, it can happen sometimes, but um, it's usually over minor things that you know maybe they didn't think about, and you can just interject and say, "Hey, well, what about this?" And you know we can do that and knock that out. And they're like, "Oh, that's a great idea." You know, I didn't didn't think about that. So it just it's kind of it's it's a lot of reading the room because you know you're you know as you're a professional, you're also dealing with professionals, and you need to respect what they're what they think is best, you know, at their level, but also in a way you have to learn how to communicate in a way that's, 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 uh, that's, um, effective for, for everyone involved. Um, it's just a, it's just a lot of reading the room and seeing what's right. Uh, but for the smaller companies, there's a lot more in, involved process that goes beyond just the, the production business side. It's more so, okay, well, analytically, you know, this is how this is going to perform versus this piece. And now you're getting into more of marketing speak rather than just, uh, you know, video production. We're not talking about how many days we need on set. We're talking about, you know, you know, you know, how quickly we want to cut to show certain things and, and including certain parts of certain data that they want to show as a business to help carry their business along. So it's just, a, it's just a matter of um, just kind of seeing when that, that fits right. No, yeah, that's like um, basically what I was kind of getting at is figuring out like there's a advertising agency a lot of the times or like an in-house marketing department. And like you said, you have to be careful when you're like negotiating terms or trying to get an idea on the table. Rather, like you don't want to upset anyone by saying that won't work or that's a terrible idea. You kind of just like, oh, how about we change the that from this or we shoot it at, during sunset, that might be a better time or that kind of thing, you know, just peppering in little ideas to get your own like um, your own view of it or to make it more like in line with how you want to see it. Yeah. And this is finding a right balance too. I mean, sometimes like if they're really married to something, but you think this is really going to be, you know, also really great and you can find a way to do both. That's fantastic. Then you can provide options um, and flexibility because then they can show them later down the road, you know, here's what we could do. We did this and, yeah, it's just uh, it's just reading the room and seeing and seeing how to navigate that. I noticed on your like Instagram, you have performance film works. Like, what's the story behind that? Is that if you want to do a bigger project, you have those kind of guys with their giant rigs and everything to work. With? I was working as a PA one day on a on a on a big like Subaru commercial, and it was that we filmed it all up in North Georgia, and. Um, I met these guys that had, uh, they do uh, 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 Russian arm work. And um, I just, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And um, back in high school, I used to do a lot of, uh, I was in robotics outside of filming. So to be able to bring robotics and like, like you know, all that stuff together with the film world, I thought was like, in, in be a part of cars. I'm like, this has to be the perfect uh, trifecta, you know, like, you got cars like you know robotics and mechanics and um, cameras. So uh, I just kept talking to them as a PA whenever I had free time, and um, they really liked me after the the week we spent out there. And um, eventually they asked me to come back with them to come meet them at their shop. Um, we have a huge movie studios down here called Trillith that's near the airport, and um, I spent a day with them just talking, hanging out at their shop, and. Um, we kind of stayed in touch and um, eventually the owner of the company uh, reached out to me and said, Hey, we're going to be, I'm going to be back in Atlanta a couple months. Will you, will you be there? And I was like, yeah, I'll be there. It's like, why don't you uh, come meet us down? You know, uh, well, if you're free, why don't you come meet us? Let's talk more. And he kind of just, it kind of turned into like a, a very informal interview and just hanging out during the day and talking and getting to know me. And uh, he eventually just asked if I could uh, help take care of and run their Atlanta location. Um, and so now like my, I have a responsibility of going down there and making sure that our car is ready to go and making sure the shop is clean and it's, you know, being on set as a technician and they work with everyone. I mean, they've, they've worked on like every single project. It's insane what they get to do. 
Um, so the goal long term is that you know I get to you know come on with them as a technician. I get to learn with them and and just go on these really big, uh, really really big uh, high value productions. So do you own your own equipment, or you hire every time? I, I buy a bunch of different equipment. I buy and sell, and I try different things. And but you know, if I have a project that comes up that I know is going to need a camera, I don't have that camera at the moment. I'll just rent it out. Um, but I mean, if I've tried, I, I love trying different ones and, and learning how they all work. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've experienced, I've played with Canon, um, of, you know, Sony, Panasonic, Blackmagic, um, Red. It just, it just depends. It just really depends on the project and what's, what's the right tool for the job. Yeah. And just keeping up with technology because new equipment comes out all the time. So it's like a matter of what's the best tool for the job, like you said. And I, I mean, I think it's pretty fantastic. I just think um, I think it's just a matter of what works best for you, and then also coupled with what the project want, what the project calls for. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it'd be. I always hope that there's going to be one magical camera that solves all the problems that I want <laughs> in one body. But that it's you know these these companies want you to they want you to be in all their product lineups. They don't want you to just be in one. So they're very strategic about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so would you want to be like a DP or like a director? Like which one are you kind of focusing on more? I don't have a focus on either or. Um, I just kind of focus on like making a video. I kind of, I don't really look at the roles too much. Um, but generally speaking, I'm, I'm pretty much directing from start to finish. And I think that just, that's just part of it. Um, it's not something I'd choose. It's just something that just, just is requires a lot. Um, a lot of directing work, you know, you're a lot of it's time to get what to do and what you need and um, where things need to be and at what time and how to make that happen. And then part of me is producing. I mean, like, I feel like I, I feel like I, I wear a lot of different hats, so I don't really know what to call myself, but I call myself a DP because in a director, because sometimes I'm called just to shoot and just to film or be a cinematographer. I kind of lose, use those terms interchangeably. Feel free to correct me, but like, uh, you know, I've had products where they just need me to film and they, they're they in control of everything else. And then I have products where I have to see a project from start to finish, from ideation to uh, final distribution. And uh, that's definitely more than just directing for sure. Yeah, because like the way that this industry has been built, like we're talking about, is it always involved so many different people and everyone specializes in that one job. So now when it, like the gears become more affordable, like technology, like the computers are like freely available, we're now expected to do everything from create an idea to posting it and getting views. So it's like a lot of like business owners like yourself, they'll be able to offer that as like a whole package, but it's a matter of, you know, getting the same, you're never going to get the same budgets as the big stuff. But going going back to like working as a DP or a director, like I was talking to Mark Jenkinson and he expressed that he learned a lot working with other DPs. So it's like, you know, you you can learn a lot by working with other people as well, like that have done that and been there. A lot of DPs are normally they're kind of older as well. So it's like just learning those little things on set and and figuring out like the best way to do something that you might not have thought about we'll, we'll yeah. things that you didn't even think of that will make the world of a difference on your next project so it's always the older guys you got all the knowledge you got to kind of get it out of them you got to squeeze it out of them yeah, yeah. Stick, or stick around you'll 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 definitely learn quick if you don't know what you're doing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, um, I guess, do you have any uh, like advice for other filmmakers out there that like if they want to get into directing commercials or creating their own brand or business? You know, if you want to shoot more stuff, just shoot. The more you shoot, the more you shoot. And what I mean by that is the more you go out and the more you work with people and the more you get outside and, and bring stuff to life, you meet more people and those people end up wanting to do more stuff down the road and the more products that will keep coming down the road. I mean, people, if people like your stuff, they'll see it. Um, but just hang out, meet with other friends, meet people and just keep making stuff. Just keep making stuff. That's it. And the more that you make, the more that you'll get to make more. 
I, if you told me that I'd be doing stuff for Bugatti in, in like high school, I'd, I'd think you, you're crazy, man. Like, you know, so I think that's just it. Just get out and do what you love. And it's, and it's also about like uh, ego. Like a lot of people who create videos think that. And several times and that, that is a disaster. Um, yeah, the, the, you cannot have an ego. You gotta be, you gotta be very nice to everyone you work with. Treat, treat anyone, no matter what, how much are getting paid that day. Everyone has a, gets the same amount of respect. Everyone's a person at the end of the day. You know, no one's bigger than the other. Like, a, a PA may have a great idea for the director. The director can even think of. Like, even on, if I have a commercial, I have someone just assisting, and they ask me, and they say, "Hey, we should do that." Like, I am open ears to everyone. Everyone's got a say on something. So. I think that's a great way to look at it because, you know, everyone's 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 capable of doing great stuff. I think. And and so how how do you deal with like a conflict if you're on set or you're working on a project and somebody kind of says that you have to do something this way or that way? Like, how do you internalize what they're saying and like respond appropriately you know if i think there's a better way to do it i say okay look, we can do that we can let's why don't we do both and then later on we can decide if you want to we can make changes and then so it's just a matter of finding balance to give them what they want and what you think that they should really be using um but never you have to use very careful very late very careful language um you never want to put anyone down when you're talking to them everyone you want to assume they're i mean these are the clients so they really have the final say of everything they're they're in charge of who who gets on the what, um, and so it's it's a fine balancing act of being able to provide them the best solution that they think they need, that you think that they might want, but also making sure that you listen to them and provide them what they think that, what they think is better, um, and then trying to explain explain that carefully. Um, it just depends on the situation, but I think uh, just be very careful and, and and observe and record a lot of what's going on around you, and then. Uh, careful with how you provide input to the situations. And I think that you can work work through them uh, effectively from that point. Uh, yeah, just be very careful and read the room. Cool, and where do you think you learned like this, this behavior from? Was it like your parents or your school or did you learn from making mistakes? Definitely making mistakes, for sure. It's always, uh, those are always the biggest learning ones. <laughs> Those are always the biggest, biggest uh, uh, learning lessons. So I've definitely had my fair share of ups. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but um, uh, you know, I do my best to kind of not bang into the walls too much and just go forward. But um, you know, you learn, you learn from experience. So that's why I say the more you shoot, the more you shoot, because you're gonna find something and that's gonna teach you. And then you're gonna, the more you shoot again, you might end up paying another project. So it's just, it all comes from experience. Just spend more time doing what that thing is that you want to do more of. And the more you do it, the more you'll the more you'll keep doing that. Film school can only teach you so much, and then it's like, all right, here's the the theory, here's the technical, and then go off. They don't teach you about business or how to communicate with people or how to. That's why I worry about people who go to film school. I'm like, you have no idea what you're getting into. That this this is not as glamorous as it thinks. Because it's not this is not a perfect and lovely world. It's it's also just. You go months, sometimes you go months without projects and you're like, what are you going to do to survive? You know, like, it's just, it's a very hard place to break into unless you have a lot of money behind you. Maybe just tell us like what you're up to now and what, like any, any future projects coming up. I can't tell you what they are, but, um, they're really exciting. I'll tell you that they're really exciting. Um, um, there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, but, uh, some projects I, I can't, I can't explain right now, but, um, um, I'm looking forward to them for sure. So we'll see. Cool. Well, we look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Car rate, something will come. I don't know. That's the only one I can talk about that's, that's up recent, but, um, everything else I kind of keep confidential until, until the client wants to talk about it. But, um, the car week for sure, we'll see what happens. There's juggling a lot of different manufacturers and you know maybe uh, hopefully i'll see you there and uh, we'll go have a good time sweet yeah yeah i'll be at car week that might so, be um... i might call you i might honestly we could maybe figure some out because i don't want to have to ship a bunch of equipment out there I'd rather just bring people out that already have equipment that are nearby that i think that's way more efficient and it's more cost effective and i i don't have to you know i think it just i think it works out great we can try and capture some awesome footage yeah we'll talk later thank you again
Sweet. All right. Thanks, William. Thanks for joining us, and uh, have a great day. Adios. See ya. See ya.